All right, we'll now move on to immoralities and how association flows in immoralities. So, the question here is, are X1 and X3 associated? It turns out that, unlike forks and chains, they aren't. So, the association is actually blocked at X2 here. Because X2 blocks association, even when we're not conditioning on it, it has a very special name. So you might remember that X1 and X3 are called the parents of their child, X2. And that this is called an immorality because these parents are not connected, right? They're not married, but they share a child. So that might lead you to the term for this very special variable that x2 is here, collider. So colliders get their own special name because they block association here. It's, it's different from what was happening in forks and chains where x2 in those graphs was just allowing association to flow through it. And the intuition for why x1 and x3 are independent is that they are just two events that happen to cause some downstream event x2. Right, so why would x1 and x3 be dependent? And just as we did a proof for conditional independence in the chains and forks, we can do a proof for unconditional independence here with immoralities. So we start by just marginalizing out x2, and next, we're just going to use the Bayesian network factorization. So the root nodes in the graph, that's the nodes that don't have any parents, x1 and x3, show up in their own factors without anything conditioning them. And then we have a p of x2 given x1, x3, because x1 and x3 are x2's parents. Then we can push this summation over x2 all the way inside using the fact that the factor for x2 is the only thing that depends on what we're summing over, x2, along with the distributive law. And then this just sums to 1. We're summing over x2 for some conditional distribution over x2, and that sums to 1, so we get what we wanted. We get that p of x1, comma x3 factorizes as p of x1 times p of x3. In other words, x1 and x3 are independent. And what happens if we condition on a collider? Well, something very interesting happens. So if we condition on x2, it actually unblocks the path. right? So it's the opposite of what was happening with chains and forks. So even though x1 and x3 were independent unconditionally, then when we learn some information about the outcome of x2, when we condition on x2, that induces dependence between x1 and x3. To give you some intuition for this, we'll use an example of the perception that good-looking men are jerks. So say that good-looking is x1 and kindness is x3, so you get 1 for x1, if you're good-looking, 0 otherwise, and you get 1 for x3 if you're kind, and 0 if you're a jerk. And importantly, x1 and x3 are independent in the general population, when you're not conditioning on anything. And x2 will be whether or not you're in a relationship. So x2 is 1 if you're in a relationship, and 0 if you're not in a relationship. And the specific function for x2 is an and. Okay, so we'll say that you're in a relationship if you're good-looking and you're kind. So when you condition on men who are not in a relationship, if this is the generative process of the data, that means that all men who are both good-looking and kind are in a relationship. So you are not looking at those men when you're conditioning on not in a relationship. 
and you're looking at the remaining men. So the remaining men, because we used an AND function for x2 here, the remaining men are either not good looking and kind, or they are good looking and jerks, or they are not good looking and they're jerks. But importantly, all of the men who are not in a relationship and are good looking are jerks in this example. So because we condition on not in a relationship, we actually do see an association between x1 and x3. In the general population, when we don't condition on x2 at all, then we don't see an association. And I'll give you a graphical picture of that now. Okay, say that looks and kindness are now real values on a scale of 0 to 10 rather than binary values. And say that each point is a person in the general population. So you don't actually see any correlation or any association here. Looks and kindness look pretty independent. But what if I were to group the population into the people who are in relationships and people who are not in relationships? And then if we were to take this data and condition on only people who are available, people who are not in relationships, we end up with this. These are the available men. So in this subpopulation, there is a clear negative correlation between kindness and looks. And that's because we have selected only the men in the population who are available. All the ones that are not available, they were what were in the top right-hand corner there. That's why this induced association, when we select a certain subset of the population, is sometimes called selection bias. All right, so we just saw that when you condition on a collider, it induces association between its parents. What would happen if you were to condition on a descendant of a collider? So here x2 is a collider and x4 is a descendant. Well, it turns out that that would also induce association between x1 and x3 if you conditioned on x4. The quick intuition for this is just that conditioning on x4 probably gives you information about x2, so it's a bit like a proxy for conditioning on x2, and we know that when we condition on x2, then that induces association between x1 and x3. That brings us to our next question, which is, in the three different kinds of three-node graphs, chains, forks, and immoralities, what can block a path?